Welcome to Star Wars Comics and Canon. The Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 63. So then guys, we are here at the end of the first chapter of the Dr. Aphra journey. That's right, we are tackling A Rogue's End, which is issues 37 to 40 of the Dr. Aphra run from 2016. Also in this is going to be the annual number three, and in addition is going to be the epilogue segment, which is part of the Empire Ascendant comic, but I'll get into that when we get there. Now, if you haven't tuned into the previous episode of Star Wars Comics and Canon, you can check all the other Afra episodes. I'm going to quickly read them out for you. 59, 55, 51, 46, 42, 36, and 34. And don't forget that the first run of Darth Vader comics in 2015 by Kieran Gillen, which I've tackled on the show before, they all were the introduction to Dr. Afra as well. So make sure you check out those as well. But I will assume from this point that you've read all of those or heard about them all, so we can get right into it. Issue number 37 and the annual, which is annual number 3, were both out in October 2019. Issue number 40, as well as the Empire Ascendant comic, which features the epilogue, were both released in December 2019. And then the trade paperback collection, which has all of these issues, was released in February 2020. The writer for all of these issues was Simon Spurrier, and then the artist for issues 37 to 40 and Empire Ascendant epilogue was Casper Wiengaard. The colorist for all of those was Lee Lowridge, and then for the annual number three, the artist was Elsa Charatia, and the color artists were Edgar Delgado and Jim Campbell. And it's worth noting here, guys, as well, that these issues all take place just before Empire Strikes Back. In the way we look at Star Wars, that is three ABY, which is three years after the Battle of Yavin. Um, So for clarity, A New Hope is zero ABY uh, or zero BBY, depending on what part of A New Hope you check out. And then Empire Strikes Back is three years after that and Return of the Jedi is one year after that. So this one is, yeah, it's all a lead up to Hoth. And for anyone who reads the comics and has read the comics when they came out, there was a thing that was going around, which was Destination Hoth. It happened in the main run of Star Wars comics and in these Afro comics. It was like, you know, just showing how they get to Hoth and whatnot. And uh, I will be tackling the other end of that in a couple weeks time on the main run of Star Wars because the Destination Hoth is a whole another thing there. But there's a couple more of them to go first. But this is about Dr. Aphra, not about those ones, so let's get into it. Let's read out the crawl for these. Rogue archaeologist Dr. Aphra is known across the galaxy as a brilliant scientist as well as a thief and obtainer of ancient valuable artifacts, which has earned her the ire of both the Rebellion and the Empire. Recently, Dr. Aphra exposed a traitorous plot to assassinate Emperor Palpatine. This saved her life as well as the life of a sidekick of sorts, Vulada, and also earned her great favour with the regime. But Aphra's complicated history with Palpatine's enforcer, Darth Vader, could ruin the Doctor's second chance. So obviously, guys, that is all referencing the previous batch of Dr. Aphra comics, which I did tackle. And as that was about a month ago for people listening, just as a vague reminder, um, there was a woman who was the lead of the propaganda stuff in the Empire. And she essentially did this huge plot to try and overthrow the Empire by killing Palpatine, by being supported by the rebels. And she was going to do like a coup. Then she was going to betray the rebels and then basically take over where there was a power vacuum and then lead the Empire as she wanted to lead it. Dr. Aphra figured all that out. And and then basically stopped it from happening, all because this woman orchestrated the death of her mum many years ago, and so all of that came to light, and therefore Aphra was in the good books of old Palps, so, which is Palpatine. I like to call Palpatine Palps, but not, <laughs> some people may not realise that, so if I do say Palps in this episode at all, that's what I'm referring to, although Palpatine isn't in this at all, so I shouldn't have to say him again, but it is just a lot of fun to say, isn't it? Just calling him old Palps, even though he's like one of the scariest people in like the Star Wars universe. Um, but yeah, so that was basically what happened and that's where it sort of ended now from what i can tell these issues take place an unknown amount of time after that i think it's been quite a bit of time because i think the previous couple of arcs were nearer the two-year mark since a new hope and this is much closer to the three-year mark so i think there's been quite a bit of time between obviously star wars is always quite a bit 
loose when it comes to times and things because obviously you know a day on one planet can be two days or half a day on another planet that's why they call them rotations but it's all a big complicated mess which is why we use this out of universe system to measure time and things which is obviously before and after the battle of yavin in certain reference books there's like before and after the kessel run before and after the star killer incident uh, so there's loads of ways you can do it but i just find that doing it from the reference point of a new hope is generally the easiest and that's the most common one to do so with all that in mind let's get into the story of this now for clarity anyone listening i'm going to do all of the story of this with footnotes version and i'm also going to give you all the little connective tissue that fits around that as well so let's get into it let's get into issue number 37 which is the first batch of these so the comic starts with Afra floating through space and it turns out that it is a nightmare and if you guys have read the final of the Vader comic the first run which I tackled in episode 29 of Star Wars Comics in Canon Vader tries to kill Afra by just letting her out of an airlock and she floats into space seemingly dead. She then gets caught by Black Chrysanthemum and Triple Zero and stuff and then she runs off and has her own little adventures which is how this whole comic run started but she wakes up from a nightmare seeing that and it shows that she's actually aboard a ship called the Executor. I've mentioned it in numerous episodes of Star Wars comics and canon but just in brief it is vader's own super star destroyer i believe it's a dreadnought class star destroyer it's much bigger i think it's like four or five times bigger than a normal star destroyer and you get to see it get destroyed in return of the jedi when vader's on the death star 2 an a-wing crashes into the bridge of the executor and then it crashes into the side of the death star 2 so anyway they're aboard the executor and Afra's on there because she's there with some archaeological consultants and they're essentially doing this project for the Empire. Now there's a guy there called General Maximilian Veers. Now you would actually recognize Veers because he is in Empire Strikes Back. You see him and he's at the front of an AT-80. He's actually in the AT-80 that destroys the shield generator in Hoth and he wears a helmet which is quite similar to Darth Vader's in some way. Not the mask and the face part but like the top and the back part and he's actually in the 50th issue of main run of star wars which was called hope dies he's there with admiral ozzel and it looks like he died in empire strikes back but in the recent book a certain point of view the empire strikes back which is 40 short stories from minor characters basically telling the story of empire strikes back from different perspectives in that he actually manages to survive uh, which is quite a fun little fact but yeah that's veers so you would recognize him when you see uh, empire strikes back and he's there for, to speak to the group of archaeologists about something called Project Swarm. Now, Project Swarm is that they send over 100,000 Viper droids searching throughout the universe trying to find where the Rebels' new base is. Now, a Viper droid is another word for just a probe droid. Uh, you see it actually in Empire Strikes Back once again. A lot of this issue connects to a lot of Empire Strikes Back, unsurprisingly. And they were basically sent in hyperspace pods. They've got a blaster and they have self-destructs. And it sees the rebels based on Hoth when Han and Chewie go and check it out. And then, you know, Han and Chewie shoot it a little bit and then it self destructs and explodes. That notifies the Empire. And that's kind of what starts off the events of Empire Strikes Back. So, as I said, that was called Project Swarm. And there's one professor who's in charge at the moment and he's called Professor Udd. He's talking about this other place to go to. He's telling them that it's definitely the rebels are going to be there and things. Afra is dubious and things, but then Afra sees Vader kind of in the background walking away. So she follows him and says that she won't tell anyone about Luke Skywalker. Before she can finish the word Skywalker, he force pushes her into a wall quite hard and then walks away. Vlada is there. She's just like using a broom and kind of cleaning up and things because obviously she's not much of an archaeologist and she helps up Afra and and then the professor yells and then grabs Afra and takes her back into that room. It shows that they've seemingly found the rebels. Then Afra says it's not actually the rebels, it is an isotope. Now, you would recognize this from episodes 44 and 61 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. In essence, in the main run of Star Wars, the arc called the Ashes of Jeddah, the trio go back to Jeddah and they meet this group of basically they're a death cult. They like to go to places where massive disasters happen and a lot of death, and they feel like they're closer to the cosmic force and whatnot. By by watching death that's essentially what they believe they're first seen in rogue one and things and there's a character called sister six who is a zexto she's appeared in a couple of afro comics and she appears a little bit later on she used to be in the cult of the central isotoper until she laughed at one of the ceremonies and then got kicked out so they're the isotopers and they're quite cool beings and the more i read about them they are more interesting but i don't really think they're in anything other than the comics i've tackled on this show which is quite sad but um moving on anyway afro says that it's an isotope death shrine and she says that the reason that the probe droid has been shot is because the pilgrims there would have shot it there's not going to be any rebels the imperials unsurprisingly ignore what afra has to say and 
they say they need to get a ground crew. Aphra then immediately volunteers so she can try and get away from Vader because she's terrified of Vader, obviously, um, because in this whole run of comics and mainly in the Vader run of comics, she manages to betray him and outsmart him numerous times. And, you know, Vader doesn't really take too kindly to that. So on this planet, which doesn't show up elsewhere, so I'm not going to mention it, Imperials end up shooting some of the Isotoper Pilgrims in their ankles and their knees, which is quite brutal. The Professor Ud, he shows Afro that he's actually been there for research. He knew that the Rebels wouldn't be there, but he said, when else would you get the opportunity to check out such intensely ancient archaeological sites? And he's going around taking a look at all these cool things, and Afro says, well, look at this cool thing, and it's like this giant head of, like, it looks like a really massive golem of some sort. She tells him to look inside and he peeks his head through there and is like, oh my god, look at the inside of this mouth and da da. And as she does that, she signals Vulada, who presses a button on the wall and then the mouth closes, crushing the professor. When that happens, the whole floor shakes and things and a few panels on the floor move and whatnot. Vulada falls and seemingly disappears and then it turns out that Afra is now in charge because she was the second in command after Professor Ud. After all that commotion and things, there's a guy who's wearing like a helmet and a mask and things, and he runs out yelling about Jedi mind tricks and who uses Jedi powers to get everyone and those sort of things. And he runs past an Imperial officer who puts their arm out and just completely clotheslines him. And that's basically he just ran into his arm, fell on the floor, and knocked himself out. They check his stuff and it shows that this person has got rebel rations, so they take him for interrogation. They then go back to the ship and Vulad has been left in this place. Afra's just left her there. Then on the ship, Afra tells Vader about this prisoner and so he tells her to follow and attend this interrogation. The prisoner says some sort of Jedi saying. Vader takes off his helmet, or rather knocks it off, and this final panel shows that it's actually Afra's dad. Now for clarity, Afra's dad is called Corin, and he was in the first batch of these Afra comics back in episode 34 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, so if you want more information about him, just read issues 1 to 6 of Dr. Afra. but as I gave information about him all the way back in that episode, we will move onward to issue 38. So in issue 38, Vader calls for the interrogation specialists to come in, and who other than Triple Zero and BT-1? And I'm just going to read what Triple Zero says because all of Triple Zero dialogue is just absolutely golden, um, but I want to read this one out especially. And just a quick reminder, Triple Zero is a protocol droid, basically like C-3PO, but with the mind of an absolute psychopath serial killer who enjoys draining blood from people. But this is basically, imagine this is C-3PO saying this. Hello, I am Triple Zero, human cyborg relations and coercive agonies. I look forward to a long and enduring friendship based around your unanswered pleas for death. And then Corin says, Oh, it's you two. That's nice. It's a comfort to know my daughter still has her friends around her. And Aphra's face is just looking in despair and she's muttering to herself, No, 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 no. It becomes apparent that Triple Zero and BT had their minds wiped so they don't actually remember who Aphra is, which in some ways is good, but in other ways maybe not so good. Vader then leaves and Aphra begs Corin to tell them everything. She says she hasn't seen him in two years. He says that people don't change. While this is all going on, you see Vulada back at this old temple on this random planet. And Vulada has got a recording from Afra. It's basically saying that she left her there on purpose because it was safer there. And then as it kind of zooms out or pans out, it shows that there's these creatures who are slowly trying to get Vulada. Now, the way I would describe these creatures would be sand sharks. So just imagine a shark, but instead of swimming in the ocean, it swims in sand and it has glowing red eyes. So yeah, unfathomably terrifying. That's what these things are. I couldn't find explicit confirmation of what they were called online, so I'm just going to call them sand sharks. Back to Aphra in the interrogation. Corrin is then waffling on about, you know, Jedi and history and all these other things. But as I always say with this show, if you want to know all the details and all the cool dialogue and interesting things, you have to make sure you pick up this comic and read it, you know, Marvel Unlimited or buy yourself a copy or whatever. And uh, you'll be able to know all the specific dialogues. This is more so the footnotes version. So Corrin is all waffling on and things. Aphra is begging him to say stuff. Corrin then confirms that the rebels ruin temples. So she manages to convince him to tell them everything he knows about the rebels. And after he confirms everything that he knows, Aphra reports to Vader. Vader then decides to go to the last shrine that Corrin was at and saw the rebels at, so he demands that both Aphras go with him, as in Corrin Aphra and Dr. Aphra. I mean, Dr. Aphra's real name is Chelly. Uh, I've mentioned that once or twice, but it's just easier to refer to her as Aphra because she's normally the only Aphra, or as Dr. Aphra, um, because Chelly, um, I don't know, it just doesn't sound right, Chelly Aphra, does it? But anyway, so the two Aphras then escort Vader to this shrine. Vader leaves the Afras with BT-1 and tells BT-1 to maim them if they try and move. 
while that's happening, Aphra's just kind of looking around a little bit, you know, not going too far from BT1 so he doesn't, you know, maim her, but just kind of looking around the general area. And she figures out that the rebels were clearly in a hot place before they were there, and then they were heading somewhere cold. She tells BT1 that and says to go tell Vader, and BT1 does not. It shows Vader walking around and he says that he feels the force and then he sees some sort of force vision of his mum, Shmi Skywalker, Padme, Yoda, Ahsoka, Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan. They all look like kind of zombies almost and this is one of the times that I've actually taken a photo of this panel itself. So just for clarity, anyone can follow me at Genuine Chit Chat on Instagram, Twitter or on Facebook and when I release these episodes, usually on Saturdays when I post on social media about them, I include photos of the covers of the comics, the crawl, and then also often one or two pages that are quite cool. Um, on my Patreon, patreon.com slash genuine chit chat, um, I actually upload those photos a couple days early, so normally on Thursdays. And one of the photos that I'm going to be using on social media and have uploaded to Patreon is that panel of the sort of zombies that Vader sees in the Force vision. It's quite cool. It's just really good artwork and I really enjoy it. Vader realizes this is just like a vision and sees that it's fake, so he swings a saber around and he cuts this altar that was in the middle. He mentions that the Jedi's mind tricks might have worked once when he was a trouble lost boy, but he isn't him anymore. Aphra actually manages to overhear that because she gets nearer to where he was, and as far as BT would let her stray, and she actually overhears him say that last line. Vader then quickly wants to leave that area, orders the bombers of his to just destroy the base that they're in, and Aphra's like, well, it's mainly unexplored, how do you know they're here? And he's like, we've got enough, that's it, let's go. And then Corrin runs after him, trying to convince him not to destroy the place, and Vader force pushes him to the ground and hurts him quite badly. Vader then tells BT that he only needs one Aphra, so he says that the two Aphras can decide which one of them can die on the journey back to the ship. Because just for clarity, you know, you've got this big Star Destroyer that's in space, and it's just outside of the atmosphere and things, and you have like Imperial landing shuttles, just just smaller ships and things that transport people. A good way to show it, like an analogy, would be boats. You know, when you have like a really big boat on the ocean, you don't generally walk straight onto it. Most of the time you'll get on a little boat and then that little boat will take you to the bigger boat. Is that a general idea? On their journey back up to the ship, Afra and Corin discuss their regrets and also generally just what they've been up to because they haven't seen each other in two years. So obviously the first Afro comic, the batch of those and the amount of time she spends with her dad, that was around a year after A New Hope. Um, so that's kind of a good tell of time. After discussing and whatnot, Afra thinks that she's been a bit of a failure, but Corrin is actually happy because Afra has actually experienced emotions and has lived her life. And he says that he's proud of her and then tells BT that he's ready to die. Before BT can pull the trigger, the ship then shakes and a shock grenade goes in and stuns all the troopers that are in there, and also BT-1. The ship gets cut into, and who is there? Well, it's Inspector Tolvan and Sister Six, and they're trying to find Aphra, but they see her dad passed out on the floor and think she must be around here somewhere. So I said before, Sister Six, she is a Zexto um, in episode 46 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, which was the third volume of Afro Comics, which was remastered. That was where she was primarily. And Tolvin, uh, you should know who Tolvin is by now, but just as a recap, was an Imperial officer, and then she got demoted, but then she got promoted to Inspector after her mentor Thanoth was killed and he was killed by Vader in the Vader comics and she's had this on again off again relationship with Aphra as in Aphra just keeps betraying her constantly normally after they you know kiss or you know have sex uh, so tolvin has got a complicated relationship with Aphra and Sister Six they're both working for the rebellion now but that's where that comic ends so we're moving on to issue number 39 Tolvin and Sister Six are having trouble finding Dr. Aphra. They're looking around and Tolvin mentions that she knows she's about, she can kind of, she just knows. Then the ship's cannons move. So the ship they're on is on a Lambda class shuttle. It's the standard one I always describe. It's like a box with three fins on it. It's just the Imperial landing shuttle. The cannons move, shoot the floor, and as all the rebels kind of dive out of the way, Aphra jumps out from inside of the cannons. So she was in like the underplating. It then shows that there's a protocol droid called TZ in the ops room, or the operations room. Uh, TZ was in the previous batch of Afro Comics. I tackled an episode 59. It's just a standard protocol droid. I believe they are RA7 protocol droids, so they've got like bug eyes in a sense. They're the ones that are known as like Death Star droids. So they don't look quite as human as C-3PO, but generally they do the same thing. 
Tolvin is talking to TZ, who's watching loads of screens and monitors and things, and then they lose contact with TZ. So Tolvin and the gang of rebels go, run straight to the operations room and find that TZ is actually wearing like Afra's hat and a jacket of hers. And then as soon as they realize that, Afra traps them in the room by closing all the doors. Tolvin just manages to escape by darting out at the last moment. And while that happens, Afra contacts BT. She tells BT to get Corin, and then she'll help out Triple Zero and BT-1 remove their restraining bolts. While Afra's making her way through the ship, she then hears Tolvin's voice, and it turns out that Tolvin actually got an electric tattoo as well, which synced with hers when they were in a Kreska jail, or rather, when Tolvin tried to rescue Afra from a Kreska jail, which was in the Catastrophe Con arc of Dr. Afra, which I tackled in episode 51 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. So what this means is their electric tattoos have synced, and so they basically have short-range communication between each other, and they can feel each other's feelings and also each other's thoughts. Now, I have looked up things to do with electric tattoos before. Nothing has really come up. Either I'm looking in a, the, all the wrong places, or everything in these Afro comics is the only knowledge we have about electric tattoos. But they're quite a cool concept, and this is quite an interesting sort of aspect to them. And it's got like Tolvin and Afro sort of talking, and you know, not re- not really getting along that well as they often don't and then Tolvin shoots Afra in the shoulder. Afra then pushes Tolvin into a rubbish dump and it's much like the one in A New Hope when they're um when Luke, Leia, Han and Chewie they fall into that garbage uh, crusher area and there's the Dianoga who grabs Luke's leg and pulls him underwater and things. It's basically like that like there's water and rubble and that sort of thing and they're in this trash compactor thing they're trying to fight for a little bit Tolvin punches Afra in the face and then Afra tries to read Tolvin's minds to find out the rebel's base and then there's more back and forth and things and then eventually Afra says well what am I thinking right now and the next panel is them making out Shortly after that, Afra wakes up next to Tolvin neither of them are wearing any clothes and it seems pretty obvious that they have had sex Afra manages to get the location of the rebel base from Tolvin while she is sleeping by using electric tattoos and things and finds out it is in fact Hoth. Afra manages to sort of skulk away and then some alarms go off that wake up Tolvin. She goes up to the bridge and her colleagues say to her, where have you been? And she's like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, continue. And it turns out that Afra jettisoned all of the escape pods from the rebel ship that they're on. Sister Six had put a tracker on the Imperial shuttle that Afra was on, so the rebels jump into hyperspace and pursue it. While this is happening, it shows that Vulada is still running from sand sharks and things, and she actually sees the Imperial shuttle land. It lands, and she runs over there thinking, oh my god, it's Afra's here, you've come to save me and things, yells out, and then the door opens and Corin is there, and he doesn't really know what's going on, he doesn't know how he got there or why he's there. It cuts back to where the escape pods were kind of floating through space and things, and it shows that Afra hid in one of those escape pods with BT, and she tells him to send a message. The message gets sent to Triple Zero, who passes the message on to Darth Vader, and it tells Vader that Afra has found the rebel base, and she says in her message to dress warm, and that's where issue number 39 ends. So let's get on to the final issue, somewhat, in this arc, and this is issue number 40. So this whole issue has a lot of monologuing from Afra. I'm not going to read pretty much any of it at all. Uh, as I said, if you want to get the full experience, buy the comic, support the creators, um, and also or read them on you know Marvel Unlimited, things like that, and then tweet about how I got you into the comics and tag all of the people involved, the artists and things, Simon Spurrier. Just tell him that I got you into the comics. <laughs> um, obviously, I am joking in that regard. You don't have to do all that. I would appreciate it, but you don't have to. Um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of Afra monologuing here. It is really, really good, this last issue. I would really recommend people read it and whatnot, um, but I'm not going to read out Afra's monologue. But in essence, she believes that she is a lost cause, but she has pushed her loved ones together. It shows that Tolvin manages to save Vulada and Corin from those sand shark things that were going after them. So it shows that she managed to orchestrate Tolvin and Corin and Vulada all being at the same place at the same time. While that's happening, Afra is actually on a frozen planet, and Afra is saying to Darth Vader that the rebels are there on the planet they're on, and the planet they're on is actually called Tython. Now to clarify, I'm going to say where Tython is, but I'm going to clarify, I'm not going to spoil things, because I think there's a couple of people who listen to this who still haven't watched The Mandalorian. To those people I say, what's wrong with you? Go watch The Mandalorian. But Tython appears in The Mandalorian series too. 
There is a time where a certain character sits on a certain magical object, shall we say, which is a Jedi shrine of some sort, and sets out a call to the Force that eventually someone does answer. That initial planet there on is Tython. It is meant to be one of the oldest known Jedi sites. So I think it's Tython as well as Arcto, which Arcto was in uh, The Last Jedi. Those are two of the places that they believe that some of the first Jedi temples were ever there, some of the first places the Jedi ever were or where the religion was founded and things. And so that's where they are right now. Anyway, they go into this place and it shows that there's been like a massive amount of holes cut through the ice and it seems to be some ancient Jedi temple of some sort. And Vader says to the Imperials that are with him to kill Aphra if there are no rebels here. Veers is with them and they use scanners and things and it says there's no signs of rebels, there's no heat signatures, there's no evidence the rebels have ever actually been there. And so Vader says to kill Aphra, and just before the order can be carried out, a wall lifts up from the floor that seems to be made out of Kyber. It turns out that BT-1 triggered this wall rock thing separating them, and it was because Aphra made that deal I mentioned, to remove the restraining bolts from Triple Zero and BT-1. She does that, Triple Zero makes a comment about how to get some R&R by causing her some incredible pain, Vader starts to break through that wall, and Aphra says to Triple Zero, well, you could kill me here and then Vader will destroy you, or you can try and escape with me, and you probably don't know all the ins and outs of the booby traps in this Jedi Temple, do you? So with that, Aphra then goes through several traps and things, and she manages to, you know, not activate any of them because she knows where they all are, but Vader doesn't know where they all are. So Aphra is leading Vader and fellow Imperials through lots and lots of traps. Um, there's one which there's like lava shoots out, or and there's fire that shoots out of another, and there's just like lots of standard booby traps you'd expect from any Indiana Jones film, really. Um, some of the Imperials get killed, but obviously Vader is generally fine. Vader tells the Imperials to just withdraw and go back to the ship while he continues onward. And then after numerous traps and things that are quite cool, Aphra allows Vader to approach her. He starts to get closer and then Triple Zero darts out and attacks Vader. Triple Zero stabs Vader in the chest with numerous things. Vader then just slices him up into several little pieces. And then the things that he was kind of stabbed with seem to ignite. Or they're either mini explosives or they ignite in some way. Which causes Vader quite a lot of pain and he's all like part on fire and starting to smoke and that sort of thing. Vader is then leaning against this pillar, and then Aphra says, all right, it's the moment of truth, and then reads out something in this ancient dialect. And then I'm just going to read out the dialogue specifically of what Aphra says. This is part of the monologue. And she says, everyone stands alone at the end. I guess maybe that's the true measure of life, isn't it? It's not how folks judge you, not how the galaxy weighs you on some dumb binary scale. It's whether or not you can live with yourself when you're alone with your choices. And while that's happening, you see that Vader, you know, the, he's still in pain from all the damage he's taken from those weird explosive parts. And you see Vader kind of have a moment to think about his time as Anakin and Palpatine and all those sorts of other things. It shows Vader is in this strange structure made out of kyber crystal. And I'm going to read exactly what Aphra says here. It's a confessional. Solid kyberite, my dad thought. He spent years looking for it. All those centuries of sinners whispering their guiltiest regrets to the heart of a force active mountain pretty overwhelming I bet for anyone tuned in, especially if they've already got a few regrets of their own. So Aphra says all of that to Darth Vader and then he uses the force to push her out of the way and she immediately yells out BT take out his legs. So BT starts firing loads of things onto Vader damaging him and his armor even further. Then Vader uses the force to pull BT apart like rips him apart completely into loads of different pieces and Aphra comments that she thought that Vader's power would be eclipsed by you know him being in this kyber confessional and whatnot and obviously she was in somewhat correct but also in some ways wrong. Aphra then speaks directly to Vader again saying that she guesses there is guilt and pain in his past and that she says that they all come out eventually and if you don't pay attention to your pain and you don't confront it it's just going to build up and up and up and it's going to come out much worse than it ever did. Vader is in quite bad condition now at the moment he's like laying on the floor he's barely able to get up and barely able to talk and he says to her that yours will not be the hand that kills me she comments saying kill you come on it's not like that I'm like your biggest fan and she's like I'm also not stupid enough to try and you know kill you but you know you do represent certain opportunities look think of it like this whoever you once were that lost little boy right and then he yells out and she's like, oh sorry hit a nerve there whoever you were is what you represent that really matters one big scary reputation wrapped up in a cyber suit and i can use both 
don't pick a fight with an archaeologist in a spooky old ruin, and don't wage war against a tech criminal if you're half machine. She shoots him with this tasery looking thing and it connects to his chest plate and electrocutes him and he collapses to the floor. And then it shows that the executor that is above Tython and things receiving a comm transmission from Vader. Now it shows that Aphra is actually speaking through this comm thing and it is making it look like it's Vader. And it speaks to this Imperial officer and tells this officer to get access to the data registry for Project Swarm. The officer is a bit apprehensive and saying, um, we should check with Admiral Ozzel. And then her as Vader says, that was an order. The officer is like sweating heavily and things and says, well, I need the verification code, you know, today's unique command. And Aphra manages to quite easily find that and then gets Vader's suit or whatever to say it. The officer then sends Vader to the information and whatnot. And then he questions, uh, Vader, you, you seem to be altering some of the probe droids records, sir. In fact, there's a huge number of deletions here, hundreds of records we haven't even analysed yet. Um, I really think you should check with um, the Admiral before I upload these instructions. And then as Vader, she says, do you know what happens to those who irritate me, officer? And then this officer is like scared and says, okay, uh, I've done it. The commands have been implemented. And then Aphra says, at a boy, and then unplugs from Vader. So just for clarity, I read all that quite verbatim. In essence, it's just that a lot of that data and information that has not yet been analysed, she basically used Vader as a voice and things to scare an Imperial officer into accepting the command to delete loads of them. And it shows that Aphra actually did it to give the rebels a few extra weeks because it flashes to one conversation that she kind of had while she was connected with Tolvin, where it was confirmed that the rebels really need a couple more weeks before their full defences on Hoth are actually going to be operational. It shows that Vulada, Tolvin and Corrin are now all on Hoth, and Vader says that he's going to find Aphra. She says she knows, um, but she also says to him that she hopes he gets to do something truly good one day. And then it shows that she ends up finishing talking and then this whole monologue thing that's been going on for the for the whole issue that I've only read a very, very small part of out, um, it actually gets sent to Hoth via an encrypted message. Aphra then takes a ship, she's got Triple Zero's head and then BT's little processor core all plugged into this computer that's on the ship. And then she says that she wants to go and see everything. And that is where issue number 40 ends. So that is technically the end of the Aphra run, but there is something else left. And basically, it's the epilogue. Now, there was a one-shot comic called Empire Ascendant that got released. It has four short stories in there. Um, one is this epilogue, which is for Dr. Aphra. One is the epilogue for the main run of Star Wars comics. I will be tackling that when I finish the Star Wars comics, which will be two episodes of the main run of Star Wars time, I think. So it'll be like, you know, a month or two away. And then the other stories that Empire Ascendant has is there's like a prequel to the Bounty Hunters comic. It's kind of like bridging the gap between Target Vader and the first issue of Bounty Hunters. And then another one is like a Darth Vader sort of mini story thing as well that kind of connects the dots from the end of the Darth Vader run and the end of the Doctor Aphra run to the third Darth Vader run, which is set between Empire Strikes Back and A New Hope. But they all of these things in Empire Ascendant, they're just kind of like short stories to kind of wrap up or kickstart some of the comics that end and start. It's just a nice way to kind of filter it into Hoth. Um, so I'm going to read out the details of the one for Aphra. And as I said, it's actually literally called Epilogue. That is the name of the short story. The other three are called different things and I'll get onto those when I eventually tackle them on other episodes. Um, but yeah, so this is the Epilogue. It's quite short, so I'm just going to kind of run through it. It starts on Osri 2, which is a planet that doesn't really show up elsewhere. There's some rebels that are rounded up by some stormtroopers and other Imperials. One of them says some words that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then one of the Imperial officers continues this strange cryptic sentence. And then it shows that he is a deep cover operative. The Imperials then all get shot and taken down. And it shows that Tolvin extracts this guy. This guy, he was a deep undercover officer. So he was obviously working for the Rebellion, but he worked his way up in the Empire so that he could basically be under cover for them. So Tolvin extracts him and the other rebels that were rounded up and things, and then leads to Hoth. Now Aphra's monologue that was in issue 40 of Aphra, which was run through the whole issue, that then also gets read basically throughout every panel of this comic as well. It is quite a cool monologue and it works well with the story. I'm not going to read it, so if you really want to hear it or really want to read it, then check out issue 40 of Dr. Aphra or pick up the Empire Ascendant comic. As I said, all these things are on Marvel Unlimited. They might be on Hoopla. Um, and I think they're on Comixology, so you can find them. 
Here's got Tolvin, and she's checking around the Hoth base, just making checks, making sure certain things are happening. And Vulada is there, and she's herding Tauntauns with her Quaber Worm called Gertle. Now, the Quaber Worm is that giant beasty thing. I described it in the episode that Vulada was introduced in. Um, she was in episodes 55 of Star Wars Comics and Canon and episode 59 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, which were the last two volumes of Dr. Aphra. And for clarity, Tauntauns, you get to see them in Empire Strikes Back. They are repto mammals so they're kind of like mammals with some degree of reptilian tendencies or traits i would assume and they are actually local to hoth and a fun little fact jabba actually has a stuffed tauntaun head on his wall right next to where han solo was frozen in carbonite so anyway, Vulada with these um, Tauntauns, she was herding these Tauntauns with her Quabel Worm, and Tolvin contacts her and says, we need to move on. It was also confirmed that Tolvin thought that she commanded this Quabel Worm to be destroyed, but one of the rebels comments saying that the princess overruled her order. Tolvin then goes and gets Corin, Aphra's dad, and then gets them all to go into the briefing room. Aphra's message is then shown to them on holocoms and things, and then afterwards the trio go and sit outside and then just kind of talk about Aphra a little bit. They discuss if they think she ever did any good or not, and as they get discussing that, someone calls out to them, and it is Luke Skywalker. Luke confirms that he did actually meet Aphra. He says that he sensed there was some degree of good in her, and it turns out that they've got some imperial chatter that says that some woman who matches the description of Aphra perfectly has set them back weeks due to an internal sabotage on their computer systems. And Luke says that they'll actually have time to sort out the shield generator, and they may even have time to sort out the evacuation plans, which obviously are key to the survival of the rebellion in Empire Strikes Back. He then leaves and the other guys mention that, you know, she also did save Palpatine's life, so maybe not so good. And one of them says, should we, should we tell him? And the other one's like, no, no, let's not tell Luke about that. Um, he's a dreamer and we don't want to, you know, bring him crashing down to reality. And then this sort of epilogue kind of finishes with these guys, the trio, Corin, Vulada and Tolvin, thinking that Aphra is kind of an in-between of causing trouble and staying out of trouble. And that's just where she is. And that's where the little epilogue ends. So I think it's, it ends on quite a nice note that although she's, you know, screwed a lot of people over and done a lot of horrible things to these people, that they all are in the rebellion in the end and they're all kind of happy. In one of the issues in this arc as well, Corin had his apprehensions about joining the rebellion. He, you know, obviously they trashed the temples and things, so he wasn't really too happy about that. Um, but he does actually kind of come around to them because he realizes that the rebellion actually uses a lot of Jedi teachings and sayings in their general mantra, in the way they they go about things they try and use some of the Jedi's teachings and he really respects that because he basically worships the Jedi. So I thought that was quite a nice little thing where just these three people, Vulada, Tolvin and Corin, they all are in the rebellion because of Aphra and also that if it wasn't for Aphra sabotaging and doing all those other things then the rebellion may not have survived Empire Strikes Back. They may have been destroyed on Hoth because if the Empire had got there even a few days earlier or anything like that, it could have meant the end. I mean, there is the other argument that if Aphra hadn't been involved, Palpatine may have been destroyed and the entire empire may have been in disarray. But let's just say for argument's sake that Palpatine wouldn't have died if that whole plan from the previous arc had gone through and that the empire would have got to Hoth a lot quicker. So I think that's just quite a nice note to end on with Dr. Aphra, the fact that she actually did all these things. But there is one little issue that's left to go and that is the Dr. Aphra annual number three. Now, for clarity, the annuals, they come out well, seemingly about yearly, you know, they're called annual, that's kind of the point. And the last two annuals, I'm pretty certain I've read out on this podcast when they were in the correct episodes and things. Now, this one is a bit of a weird one. I think it is set generally before this arc, but it could have actually just been set after this. In the trade paperback of A Rogue's End, it goes issue 37, 38, 39, 40, the annual number three, and then it finishes on the epilogue. So take that as you will. I just thought that the epilogue connected with issue 40 quite nicely, especially when reading it out to you guys. It just makes it easier. So I'm going to tackle annual number three. So it's called The Arrangement and it has a different crawl. So I'm going to read that out to you guys now. The tyrannical empire rules the galaxy, but on the fringes of known space, a thriving criminal underground flourishes. Despite little hope for freedom from imperial rule, there are still many who seek to profit from it. Rogue archaeologist Dr. Aphra has earned a reputation for herself, not just as a brilliant scientist and a master thief, but as someone who cannot be trusted. Aphra is after fortune and glory, no matter who gets hurt in the process. She has made many enemies, some out of old friends. After earning the Emperor's favour and gaining a precarious new position within the Empire, Aphra is starting to learn that it can pay to do right by your friends. 
So this issue starts with Afra in some sort of junk room and she's speaking into her camera and a Trandoshan is watching it on a data pad. Now, it appears obviously by the crawl and things that this probably took place just before the whole Rogue's End arc that I've been tackling in this episode. Um, so I would presume she just found a place to hide aboard the Executor when she wasn't needed and then recorded all this stuff. Once again, it's a bit hand wavy, but I, that's what I would presume. And the events in this, they're depicted in Doctor Aphra 30 as well, which I tackled in Star Wars Comics and Canon episode 55. Basically, there's characters Winloss and Nock. Nock is a Trandoshan female. Winloss is a human male. They're a couple, um, which is very unusual in the Star Wars universe for those two species to well, be into each other. And it's kind of like their story intertangled with Aphra. It is a cool story. It's probably worth a read, but I will pre-warn, I'm not overly a fan of the art style. I want to commend the artist Elsa Charatia for obviously drawing all these things because it it does look all right it's just the problem is is that after reading you know 40 odd issues of afro where it's in a certain style and quite detailed and looks quite realistic this is quite a cartoony style so i thought i'd pre-warn that before going forward so it shows that afro is talking to this data pad and telling a story and she speaks about Nock's past. Now, Nock is a Trandoshan. Uh, the most famous Trandoshan would be Bosk. Uh, Trandoshans, they follow this god called the Scorekeeper, um, which basically allows them to confirm to themselves that hunting creatures is okay. In essence, they think that, you know, creatures get stuck on their planets or planets that they control, and then they hunt them and whatnot. And then if they kill them, then they get points for the Scorekeeper, which helps them in life and potentially the afterlife, that sort of thing. And also, Trandoshans hate Wookiees. I haven't found an explicit confirmation of why that is, but I think the general idea is that Wookiees are one of the few sentient creatures in the universe who can actually match Trandoshans for strength and those sort of things, and Trandoshans are a very proud, pride-filled people. So anyway, Nock is doing this Trandoshan ceremony, it's kind of like a coming-of-age thing. She gets betrayed by a fellow Trandoshan called Skikesk, and Nock has got more emotions than most Trandoshans have, and has more of a kind heart. And Skikesk makes it so that her ceremony means that she has to kill and skin a baby Wookiee, which apparently is like the cutest thing in the world, but you can't see it very well in this, unfortunately. I mean, we know what young Wookiees look like from the holiday special of Star Wars, but that isn't canon, and fingers crossed, they don't look like that at all. I'm just joking a little bit. If you watch The Clone Wars, uh, you actually do not only get to see Trandoshans doing the whole scorekeeper thing, um, but that's where Ahsoka Tano meets Chewie, actually. Actually, which is quite interesting but also you do get to see a young Wookiee in another arc with Ahsoka in it it's a youngling arc it's where these younglings go to Ilum with Yoda and Ahsoka and they get their lightsaber crystals it's a really cool arc and the Wookiee has one of the coolest lightsabers there is made out of wood and things like that David Tennant even guest stars in it it's a really really cool arc and so you do actually get to see young Wookiees in that but obviously the Wookiee there is just like a young one not a baby Wookiee so to my knowledge in the canon we haven't specifically seen a baby Wookiee but anyway Anyway, I digress. So Nock is at the ceremony thing. She refuses and then gets expelled. And then her brood line gets purged. So basically her family all gets killed. Nock then after that shortly meets Winloss. And they became monster trappers. And they formed the bond eventually. But Nock will refuse to kill animals. Unless it's a specific life or death situation. Where there's no other conceivable way out. But she will go to any means to basically not kill something if she doesn't have to. While Nock is off with Winloss exploring the galaxy, it's confirmed that the person who betrayed her, Skikesk, actually leaves the tribe of Trandoshans and has become one of the galaxy's most wanted psycho villains, which is what Aphra called it. So Nock is listening to Aphra talk about these things on the data pad, and it's basically, it's just a handheld screen, essentially. It looks a little bit like a Game Boy Advance or a PlayStation Portable PSP, just any sort of handheld screen, maybe like an iPad sort of thing, but a bit smaller, those, those sort of things. And it's confirmed that Afra knows where Skikesk is. So in exchange, Afra asks Nock and Winloss to deliver a message for her, and then she'll confirm where Skikesk is. They're in Chalmun's spaceport, which is their Tatooine cantina. So you know in A New Hope, when Obi-Wan meets uh, Han Solo and stuff, that is Chalmun's spaceport. And they speak to this bartender who's called Shrem. Now, this is a different bartender to the one that we see in A New Hope. The one in A New Hope specifically is called Wu He, and he's in the Certain Point of View book of the A New Hope. He's the one who doesn't want, you know, says no droids allowed, that sort of thing. I spoke about him quite a lot before, but essentially his family got killed by 
droids, so he doesn't like them very much at all. And also generally bars and cantinas don't like droids anyway because they take up a lot of space and don't drink any liquids or any things that you buy there. So that's generally why the, the droids weren't allowed in there. But this person, this bartender, isn't Wuha. It's a guy called Shrem. So Shrem gets talking to Winloss, who's ordering drinks and things while Knockers at the table watching this datapad thing, and Shrem warns Winloss about going after Skikesk because he's so dangerous and things. Shrem claims not to know Dr. Afra when her name is mentioned, but does a flashback showing that he actually does know Dr. Afra. And then Winloss leaves this little creature that they caught at the bar for like 30 credits, just to leave it there just while they go off and do something else. After they leave and whatnot, Black Chrysanthemum enters. Now, Black Chrysanthemum, he is a common acquaintance of Dr. Aphra's in this run and also in the Darth Vader run. He's with her quite a lot. He also shows up in the journals of old Ben Kenobi comics that I tackled a while back as well, which are in the main run of Star Wars comics. He's basically a big, black-furred, wookie bounty hunter who isn't very moral and is very, very brutal when it comes to fighting. So anyway, Black Cassantin enters the cantina, and it turns out he has a big bounty on him from Jabba. When he appeared in the journals of Old Ben Kenobi, essentially he was hunting down Obi-Wan because Jabba wanted the person who stopped this gang to be apprehended because it was Jabba's gang, and it was Obi-Wan, and Black Cassantin managed to track him. Black Cassantin fought Obi-Wan, lost, and so he just bailed out of shame. And then Jabba, because of that, Jabba, you know, put a bounty on his head. So Black Cassantin, he wants to take this creature thing and give it to Jabba as a gesture. So he offers to pay a lot of money to this bartender and it's confirmed that it was just after Aphra paid him back for his whole tab that she ran up with him, which is kind of like a running joke throughout the Aphra series that she keeps owing Black Crescenton more and more money. But in the previous arc, that all got paid off. So yeah, Black Crescenton wants its scurrier thing, which is, it's a little creature. It's like almost like a rat, but a bit bigger. He'll pay lots of credits, but then Shrem says no because, you know, they've got a reputation to keep at the spaceport. And Shrem then says that if Black Cassantin really wants to buy this thing, he'll have to talk to Chalmun, who's the owner of the spaceport cantina. And Chalmun is also a Wookiee. So after a while, Black Cassantin leaves, and then Winloss and Nock come back. They failed the mission that they were on, which isn't really detailed, and Shrem wants to provide Skikesk's location in exchange for this little creature thing, because it's confirmed that Shrem actually has history with Skikesk. And it shows that him and Skikesk actually have also met Aphra as well. They kind of seemingly screwed her over in a job. So they agree to that. They let the bartender, Shrem, have this little creature and they go off to get Skekesk. So it shows that Nock goes after Skekesk, manages to attack his whole team that's with him, and Skekesk does actually escape. And while this is happening, Shrem goes to Jabba the Hutt directly with this little creature thing because he thinks that because it's worth quite a lot of money, because Black Crescenton tells him that the, the Hutts value it quite a lot, that he wants to go there directly to try and sell this thing to Jabba. Shows that Black Chrysanthemum is actually already at Jabba's, as well as Winloss and Nock, and they give him a data pad, which is from Aphra. It confirms that Aphra actually crossed him, and the creature is worthless. And he only hears this after giving the creature to Jabba, and it looks very similar to the creature that Jabba would actually have wanted, because the huts eat these strange creatures, but it's actually a slightly different one. It's a subspecies that spits quite a lot when it is scared. It spits in the face of Jabba. Jabba is not overly happy about that, and it confirms that, yeah, Aphra double-crossed him because Skikesk and Shrem were kind of bad people, so she orchestrated this whole thing, including a black croissant and saying that this creature was worth a lot of money, all just so she could basically get one up on him. The last few panels of this show that Skekesk and Shrem are then fed to Jabba's rancor, and Winloss and Nock try to come to an arrangement with black croissant as they leave Jabba's palace. Um, that is the end of that little story. I obviously just gave the footnotes version, it's a bit of backstory to Winloss and Nock, and there's some cool dialogue in there, it's quite fun seeing the back and forth between Nock and Winloss, who are like a couple, um, but their interactions are quite funny. I would generally recommend this one, I think it's, it's fairly cool, but as I said, I found the art style a little bit jarring compared to other Afro stuff, but it is still a lot of fun anyway. But yeah, guys, that is the end of this episode and the end of the Dr. Aphra run from 2016 that was started by Kieran Gillen and finished by Simon Spurrier. It's a really cool run. It is one of my favorites of the main run of Star Wars. I think the Darth Vader 2017 run is still my favorite. Then maybe the 2015 Darth Vader run and then this. Uh, I'm not overly sure if I'm being 100%, but it's still a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. And if you guys have got all the way to the end of this journey and you haven't picked up an Aphra comic, I would recommend it. They they are a lot of fun. They're really, really cool. Um, but what have we got coming up? I'll try and keep this generally brief, but I will quickly add in here that there's the Comics and Motion Book Club that is now out. Uh, that got released on Wednesday before this episode aired. So 
I believe that was the 7th of July. Myself, Matthew B. Lloyd of Classic Comics, and also Dave Horrocks of the TV and Movie Show, we all talk about the 2017 Darth Vader comic, the first volume of it. And it's a lot more of a discussion show, our interpretations of certain things, how we feel about these things, and it's just interesting to get other people's perspectives on it, because obviously last week I tackled the 2017 Vader run, but it was more just giving you guys the plot information and all those sort of things. So if you listen to the Comics in Motion Book Club and you haven't checked out the Darth Vader episode, go and do that. And if you listen to the Darth Vader episode but haven't listened to the Comic Book Club, go and listen to that. You know, just listen to both of them because one will give you a lot of extra information and cool connections and the other one will give some really interesting opinions and interpretations on certain elements of it. It got released the day of recording this, so the 9th of July. Um, myself and Chris Phelps of the TV and movie show on Comics in Motion, we spoke about Black Widow. Is a spoiler-filled discussion. I'm not going to say anything about it here because the film only came out like two days ago. But me and Chris saw it the day it came out. And in short, I did enjoy it. And uh, yeah, we, we speak about it quite a bit. So if you have seen Black Widow or you don't mind spoilers when people are talking about movies, make sure you check that out. That is on the feed of Comics in Motion. I know the majority of you guys do listen on the feed of Comics in Motion, but there's a couple of you who listen on YouTube. So if you are listening on YouTube, just find any podcast player with Comics in Motion, you know, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, those sort of places, and find Comics in Motion and you will be able to hear mine and Chris's thoughts on Black Widow. So what have we got aside from that? Well, next week I should be doing the first part of the War of the Bounty Hunters massive crossover event. I tackled the prelude last month, and so then we're on to part one specifically. Now, I should be able to get it done in time. At this moment, I've only got two of the comics in my possession because the other like three or four of them are due to be delivered in the next couple of days. So as long as there are no delays with that, next week will be War of the Bounty Hunters. If there are any major delays, then I will probably have to swap it for another episode and then do the War of the Bounty Hunters the following week, but I don't think that will have to happen. Then the week after that, I will be doing another batch of the Main Runner Star Wars comics. And there's only two more of those to go, volumes, and then that's at the end of those, which is quite exciting. Then the week after that, I'll be doing the next batch of the... 2017 Darth Vader run I believe and then at some point I'm aiming to do another book review of Into the Dark I read it a little while ago and I made some notes it's just I've been so busy recently that I just haven't had a chance so I will be doing that but I am also going to say that in August there's going to be two weeks where I will not be releasing standard episodes of Star Wars Comics and Canon I've got a couple of ideas that I'll probably release like bonus episodes myself and Megan we have a Patreon together well, it's patreon.com slash genuine chit chat and we have a show on there called Afterthoughts that we do like once or twice a week and we've tackled a lot of the Star Wars films on there and so I was tempted to just because I won't have to edit anything or really do anything with them just pop them on there and release them as like bonus episodes of Star Wars Comics and Canon I will likely be doing something vaguely similar to Genuine Chit Chat because me and Megan were basically I say we're going away we're going on a holiday but it's not abroad or anything because obviously the world is still in a bit of chaos so we're just going to be like travelling around England for like 10 days going to the Lake District that sort of thing so when I do eventually do that then I'll be releasing some Star Wars episodes most likely on here of just thoughts of the Star Wars prequels and original trilogy I imagine that's probably what's going to happen but I'll, I'll confirm that a little bit close to the time I've also got that book review that I mentioned of Into the Dark that I'm planning on doing at some point uh, and then also what I've been thinking about although this is the final Afro comic of the first run obviously in the War of the Bounty Hunters crossover there is a Dr. Afro comic in each of those batches so what I was probably going to do is continue each month doing another thing of Dr. Afro, but I think there's two story arcs before War of the Bounty Hunters in the 2020 Dr. Afro run that's written by Alyssa Wong and they are quite cool there's some really really cool things in there I did enjoy reading those so I would say in about a month's time or like in four standard episodes time I will then just do the 2020 run of Dr. Afro. so that's all caught up with the War of the Bounty Hunters I'll probably do that and I'll probably do the same thing for the main run of Star Wars comics as well and then after that I will probably end up tackling the standard Bounty Bounty Hunters run as well. So it, it's going to be just kind of making all of the ongoing issues and series catch up with what's coming out at the moment. And then it will mean that when the War of the Bounty Hunters stuff comes out, you guys will have access to all of the episodes in the right order and stuff to be able to listen in case you haven't read all of the comics. And then once I've kind of done those, as I've done all of the one shots and mini series and those sort of things, I'm going to embark on the Poe Dameron ongoing series. I'm obviously continuing with the Darth Vader 2017 series. I will then be doing the Darth Vader 2020 series as well as Bounty Hunters and those sort of things. And then I'll probably end up tackling some of the IDW comics because they are canon. Um, I've also got, there's the High Republic comics as well to do, which 
coming out monthly. So there's quite a lot for me to get myself, you know, busy with over the next coming months. I imagine by the end of the year, I will have caught up with the majority of the things. And then that's probably more so when I'll lean on the IDW stuff because there's, you know, Tales from Vader's Castle, which are written by Kevin Scott. And there's been a new one of those announced. They're like a horror anthology series, which are quite cool. There's a lot of these Tales from the Clone Wars, which I haven't read either. So I've not, I've read relatively all the canon Marvel comics but I haven't read all the canon IDW comics. That's kind of where we're at at the moment. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically what you can look forward to in the future, guys. Uh, if you have any suggestions or any thoughts, things, please let me know. You know, if any of you really specifically want me to do one of the IDW runs or anything like that, just send me a message, um, contact me, any of the social media places at Genuine Chit Chat, or send a message to Comics in Motion and it'll get to me. And I can, you know, consider that because if, if there's like a gap between like before I start the Poe Dameron series and people are clamoring for a specific mini series in the IDW comics or anything like that, then I'll consider that. That's not a problem at all. Uh, aside from that, just make sure you check in the description for all of the things I've been guesting on recently. I've been on the Like to Like Things podcast. I was on a Frank Burton show. And there's also this month of July, I'm guesting on quite a few episodes. You know, I did obviously the Black Widow thing. Uh, myself and Tonya Todd and Megan, we spoke about the first three episodes of Loki a few weeks ago. And then next week, the finale of the Loki series comes out. So myself, Tonya and Megan, it'll be the three of us so look out for that the Loki series discussion because Tonya is much more an expert on Loki than I am and uh, I'm going to be showing on the mandatory Marvel and DC podcast in the next few weeks as well which airs on Comics in Motion again and there's also just a few other bits and pieces that I'm involved with but you can always follow me on social media at Genuine Chit Chat and you'll keep up to date with all the stuff I'm involved with and you can also if you subscribe to my Patreon for £2 a month or more uh, you'll get access to my guest lists which I release every month and that is just a rundown of all the shows I've guested on all the guests that I've had on in the previous couple of weeks as well as in the upcoming month certain guests that will be coming on the show at some point but a date hasn't been confirmed as well as the afterthought shows that I do with Megan just like a little list of what we're doing for those in the future so if you do want to support the show and you want an insight into all the other stuff i get up to in one easy to find place as well as hours of additional content and early access to genuine chit chat stuff as well as early access to photos that i take for styles comics and canon then go over to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat there are a few free things there as well in the description i've got a link to the spider-man 3 afterthoughts which is free that's like half an hour of megan basically slating the film which is quite funny uh so if you want just to kind of dip your toes in and see what it's like on Patreon, then there is some free stuff on there as well. So you don't explicitly have to contribute financially. But if you want to support the show, you don't want to contribute financially, then please share this with your friends on social media, all those places and review. You can review on Apple Podcasts, you can do it on Podchaser, you can do it on loads of different places. Just tell people about it, review, and it really, really helps the show out. So anyway, guys, that is going to be enough from me. Thank you, as always, for listening, especially all the way to the end why I ramble so much. I really appreciate each and every one of you listening to the show. And as always, guys, may the Force be with you. The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else are of genuine chit chat and also the host and creator of star wars comics and canon found on the comics in motion podcast mike burton